Um, so this is very exciting, very no. fun today. And Ms. Mr. Don Waldman, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Don Waldman now. All of you know who he is. And he's going to take it.
imagine working like that and every time you hit it, those sparks come out, that's called a scoria. 1738, they built a bloomery on Sterling Forest. A bloomery is where they would have a fire, a water wheel and a stream, bellows and anvils. They would take the piece of magnetite ore, heat it up in a fire, and then that's what's called a bloom. After they heated it, about 25% of the minerals were boiled out of it. And then they would have hammer crews and they would beat it. And then that was sold to blacksmiths. So now a blacksmith could work this and maybe get a few little sparks, but the majority of the time you wouldn't get any. So you have a piece of iron. Well, a new industry started in the area. Charcoal, because you needed charcoal to go to the bloomery. This is a charcoal pit. What you would do is you would make a chimney in the center, triangle up, and then stack wood about four feet high. Then you would cover it with sod, and then you would shovel dirt on top of it, and you would light it. When you lit it, they would have probably 10 to 12 of these charcoal pits. And these gentlemen here are called colliers. They would have a 12-hour shift, and they would walk on top of these piles. The pile being this high, as it burned, it would start to settle down. If it opened up, air would get in, and they would lose their charcoal, because it has to be smoldered, not burned. Look at the forest, though. When they had the bloomery, it used about 10 acres of woods a week. If you, at that time period, well, let's say about 1865, from the George Washington Bridge to West Point, both sides of the Hudson River, there were no trees for four miles in. It was just amazing how much forest they used. After the fire was out, they would rake off the head, that would shovel all the dirt off, and then they would put it in baskets, and then the baskets would have been brought to the bloomery. Here's the baskets. I love this guy. That had to be the boss. <laughs> now, at this time, 1750, England passed the Iron Act. England petitioned the colonies to make pig iron. Anybody know why? England had lots of iron, but no charcoal because they had no trees. They had cut down every tree in England. When England found out that the colonies had found iron, they asked them if they would build blast furnaces. Here's a typical blast furnace. It was loaded from the top. Water wheel, run the bellows. This is the crucible where the liquid iron would melt and pile up. They had two open nozzles. You would open this one and that would come to slag. That's the 30% waste rock. That would float on top of the iron ore because the iron ore is heavier. They would throw that away. That would, well, it actually made good roads. As soon as iron came out of there, they would close it and make this line called the sow and let the iron come down and on each side, they would make a slit, and that's where the pig iron was cast. Every bar had to be the exact same length, because England ordered that all of the iron was to go to England, and if you're going to put it on a ship, you have to have it stackable. The first blast furnace built in Sterling Forest was in 1751. Here's Sterling Lake, this is the sluice, and here's where the bellows were, and they cast pigs in this room. Well, new rules come from England. They have about 35 blast furnaces going that England had the colony filled. And now the new rule is nothing is to be made from the iron in the colony. All of the pig iron is to go to England. You are not allowed to keep any, any of it. England will make products from it and sell it back to us and tax us for every item that they sent back to the colonies. That's because of the revolution. 
people weren't happy with the fact that we're making a product, they're taking it, making a profit, then taxing us on it. In Warwick, the little town called Belleville, and the Belleville Fort was built in 1745, and the British came and burned it to the ground in 1750. Because a forge is what takes the pig and makes products from it, against the law. Sterling had a forge in a hidden valley. I didn't know about that when I was working in the park. I was like, what? I knew about the iron industry from my mom, and I knew that the Iron Act was there, and you're not allowed to make anything. So how could Sterling Forest have a forge? So I had that big question going on. So I decided I was going to try and find out about this. I asked a few historians, and they said, yeah, there was a forge in Sterling Forest. Where is it? No one knew. Turned out that no one has known where the forge was since the Revolutionary War, because it was in a hidden valley so that the British couldn't find it. I took my compass, and at the visitor center at Sterling Forest, this is Sterling Lake, I took that compass and I walked every five degrees of the compass through the entire property. Walked zero, 180. This took me almost a year to do. Couldn't find anything. When I started in the park, they told me that there were seven iron mines. But on my compass walk, I found 41 iron mines, which I documented. Then I heard that there was a map by Robert Erskine. Robert Erskine was George Washington's map maker. And I found a copy of the map. And here at the base of Sterling Lake is the furnace. And here is a picture of the forge. I went, aha, I know that spot. As soon as I saw that in the map, I was like, I know that spot. So I went out looking, and here's where I went to. And I found a couple piles of rock, and it looks like it was a rock dam. But I noticed this. We take a close look. There's a log, a log, a log, a log, a log. And I went, oh, that's a cribbing dam. That was the dam that they had built to build the forge. When they wanted to build a dam on a stream, they would make two rectangles of logs, fill them with rocks, make angle logs, and put rocks behind it. This is the site that I found. Here are the piles of rocks. So I started exploring that area, and I saw this. It's a piece of metal in a stream about this big. And I went to the park headquarters and I said, I found this really cool thing in the stream. Can I dig it up? And they went, no. I was very disappointed. And I said, why can't I dig that up? They said, well, if you dig it up and it's something important, then we're going to have all the people exploring the site and stealing any artifacts that were there. So I said, okay, I won't do it. But see, in Sterling Forest, there are lots of hiking trails. You can hike the trails, but you have to stay on the trail. Hunting season, they allow the hunters to go anywhere they want. So I said, if a hunter sees that, he might dig it up. So I said, okay, you can dig it up. And look what I found. Anybody know what that is? It's iron. But what is it? Close. It's a gudgeon. I found the Sterling Forge that no one else has seen, and that was in 2008. That gudgeon is this piece right here. So if you took a big log, cut an X in it, you could insert the gudgeon, and this is a water wheel, and that's where the gudgeon would be. So every water wheel has two gudgeons. We brought that to the visitor center, and it now sits on the floor outside of the gift shop. Oh, I also found an ore carver. That's a different talk. So the gudgeon sits there. And then I started doing more research because now I was, I knew that there was a forge in Sterling Forest, but I didn't know much about a forge. But I learned that Roland Robbins, who's an archaeologist, did an archaeological dig and a reconstruction of the furnace. The Sterling Furnace front had fallen down and he reconstructed it. I found that he had done an archaeological dig in Saugus, Massachusetts, so we went up there. That's just northwest of Boston. 
And there was a furnace that was built there in 1647. And he rebuilt it. He found the document that showed the shape and how it was built. And right next to it, there was a forge. And he reconstructed that. So the pig iron was made in the furnace. At the forge, they would heat the pig, bring it over to a trip hammer. This shaft would turn and would hit that. Now they would make products that way. You take the pig and you make it square, and then you shape it different things depending on what the order is and what you want to make from it. So here's the actual trip hammer that Roland Robbins reconstructed. The uh, ranger there said to me, you want to see it work? We can make it work. And I said, cool. on the stream, the dam is up here, so the water wheel was up in this area, and if you overexpose, there's the trip hammer laying in the brook. So I definitely found the forge that made the great change. Well, help is needed. Why do we need help in 1778? No. We need help because Revolutionary War is going on. People revolted with the fact that England is charging us for everything they do. This was our flag at that time period. Why was a chain needed? So they can't go up the Hudson River. The British were in Canada and the Great Lakes in the Atlantic. They wanted to come down from Canada and the Great Lakes in from the Atlantic Ocean, bring ships up the Hudson River to supply their troops so they could attack the New England colonies. If they were able to attack and defeat the New England colonies, the war would be over. But if we put a chain on the river to prevent them, we would not lose the war. Because the New England colonies were the key to the Revolutionary War, and the British wanted to take the New England colonies out like crazy. George knew that, and he asked Peter Townsend, who was the furnace master at Sterling Forest, if he would make a great chain and put it across the river. This is the actual document that was signed by Peter Townsend. And the night that he signed it, they went to the forge and started making the chain the very day that he signed that paper. Now what they did is they had 17 forge fires, seven at forging and 10 at welding. The trip hammer would take a pig and make it square the forging fire would make it into a link, leaving the link open. Then the link would be taken to the welding fire. They would have one link like this, hook another one into it, weld it shut. Next fire, hook in, weld, hook in, weld. So when they were done, they had ten links with the last link open. Then they started shipping it up to the Brewster Forge by oxen wagon. But after one week, they had four feet of snow. 
So now they had to ship it on oxen sledges. A sledge is a giant sled, and there is the chain. And they took that from Sterling Forest all the way through the interior of Orange County up to the Brewster Forge. At the Brewster Forge is where they would take each 10 leak section, remember the last one was open, hook it in, weld it, take the next 10 leaks, hook it in, and weld it. That's the actual forge on the river. This is West Point at that time period, but here's how it looks today. West Point, Constitution Island. Here's the S-turn. A ship fully loaded could not make that turn. Under full sail, it could not make two 90-degree turns. And, and, so they would have to stop the ship there and launch two longboats, and they would row the big ship around that oh, turn. No. Also, in that turn, the water is 202 feet deep. So here they're stringing the chain. Here's how it was anchored on both sides and put on logs and floated across the river to West, from West Point to Constitution Island. During that time, they were building forts. Here's Fort Putnam. This is one of 15 forts that they built. Now what happened was, before this, a year before, they put a chain at Fort Montgomery, a small chain, inch and a half, and the British attacked it and took the chain. So putting the chain at West Point was a great idea because with the forts, some cannons faced it out and some faced the river. Here are all the forts. This is the firepower. So they could shoot anyone coming towards them and shoot anything on the river. So a ship coming down the river would have to stop right there. Would you stop there? No. Here's the Hudson River. This is from Fort Putnam. And here's where the chain was. Here's Fort Putnam. But all of these are forts. Now, when I was doing my research, somebody said to me, you know, Doc, Ringwood Manor made the chain. Sterling Forest didn't. But I found out that they were wrong. Because when they were putting a chain down the river lower at Fort Montgomery. They put a chain in, and they were going to put another chain in front of it called the Boom Chain. It was a smaller chain, but the British attacked before they could get the chain there. So they held the chain in a secret place, and then when the West Point chain was put, they put the boom in front of it. So yeah, they did make a chain there. And if you want to see it, this is at Washington's headquarters. This is the boom chain. West Point, at Trophy Point, you can see the chain. There are 13 links, one for each of the columns. And there is also clevis. You can take this carter pin out, pull this rod, and you can open the chain for oh friendly God. ships to get through. Also, they made a swivel. Here's a swivel. At Fort Montgomery, their chain broke two times in tidal action. If you put logs out, then you put your chain on the log, the tide could turn the logs. When you turn the logs two times, the chain would break. So they put swivels on the river to prevent the chain from breaking so the logs could spin from tidal action, but the chain wouldn't break. And the way it works is this piece goes through and it's got a head on it and the links swivel. And this is an actual swivel, but the head is broken off of it. Oh no. <laughs> and if someone would pull the tarp off of that. piece of chain with a swivel to prevent the chain from breaking from tidal action.
Okay, now. It's amazing what happened with this chain. The amount of work that the colonists put into this chain to save their country. I just can't fathom how much. Miners had to get the ore out of the ground. Colliers had to get charcoal out of the woods. All of this combined at the forts and furnace site to make this chain within two and a half months and get it across the river. This chain saved the colonies. It cut the Revolutionary War in half. And it's just amazing how many people worked together to help save their home. And if it wasn't for this chain, we'd be speaking English. <laughs> Do thou understandeth how I speak it? Pursue. <laughs> And thanks for listening. Now, one last picture. I was asked when I first saw the chain. So I have a picture here when I first saw the chain. I was a little over two, and my mother took me to West Point. And she stood me on the chair. And I can remember that. Wow, it was amazing. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much. So let's have a little review of this, just so it sticks in your head. Oh, no. All right. Um, what year did you bring up? What was the, num the number of the year that was on the screen? 1778, right. Okay. So that was in the middle of the Revolutionary War, right? Because the Revolutionary War went from when to when? 70, 1776 till? 1783. 83, very good. So right smack in the middle of it was the date that Doc was talking about, which is when things are really dangerous. Why was it dangerous? Why did they need to make this chain? Yes. <laughs> Exactly. The British were in New York City. They had moved into New York City in right at the beginning of the war, and they occupied that, so it was very dangerous. And why was the Hudson River so important? Oh, well, no. Exactly. They could have split the colonies apart. There was New England, and then there was the rest of us down here. And if they did that, they could, they could uh, bring in lots of supplies to their armies, and they could fight a fight that we couldn't beat them at. Okay? So this is a symbol, this, this chain, which is much longer when it goes across the river, a symbol of the determination of those colonists, that American, the, those Americans, the ancestors of you, because this is all happening right in this neighborhood, right? This is just, just nearby. Those ancestors were determined to have a free country, to win this war. And this, this chain, this part of the chain, is a symbol of that. That's what an artifact does. It symbolizes the story. It helps you tell the story and understand it. That's why it was so important for us to ask Doc to bring this to, to you today so you could get a grasp of what, you know, really what happened at that time through this object that's in front of you. So isn't that cool? I mean, that's really immediate. That brings history right to you. And you're really among it. So thank you very much. You've been oh, very no. attentive. Anyone else have any questions for Doc or for me or anybody? Oh, time out. Sorry. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just if oh, I. Oh, I'm so sorry. Right? That's right. Go. Hi everybody, how are you doing? You guys are so focused. I really love coming into schools. I love feeling your energy. I'm kind of like, wait, who are you? My name is Lisa DeMarco. This chain link that comes today, Doc is an expert on the chain, and we asked him to come join today. But I'm curious. Okay, I, I work at a museum. How many of you have ever been to any museum ever? Ever? Okay, hands are high. Okay, hands down. Hands down. There are science museums, there are history museums, there are art museums, there are children's museums, there are parks that are considered museums as well. Now, I'm going to ask another kind of a very interesting question. Adults, pay attention to the answer to the kids, from the kids. Who's ever seen the Hudson River? Who's seen the Hudson River? Okay, hands down.
hands down for things they've never seen their husband ever. Raise your hand. It's okay. It's okay. Where this chain link belongs, it belongs to a museum. Museums are an avenue, a place where you can go to make history come to life. But if you, uh, Mr. Wildman, he, he mentioned some dates that you saw on the screen. But I'm going to make reference to a, a date that Doc said just kind of briefly. It was the year 2008. That's not that long ago. What year were you all born? Just say it out loud. Okay. My next question to you is, when you open up a history book and you read information oh. inside, does history ever change? No. no. Okay, guess what? When you find out new information, when you discover things and you learn more, it changes what you know. So museums and artifacts are very important because new discoveries are being made all of the time. Now, I, I, I go to school a lot. What I wanted to just show you briefly, okay, Mr. Wild, you made a reference to this. I kind of uh, used a rope. I roped around the chain link that we have, that we hold at Bosco Bell. So what I'm going to ask you to do, my friend, I want you to stand up straight ahead. What I'd like you to do is stand up straight ahead. Hold this. You, my friend, it's really tall. You are, my friend. I need some lady friends. Come. just a set, but there are only nine links here. So then I'm going to reach to Don, in, uh, to Doc Bain, in, in its majesty, when the link was protecting the Hudson River, when the chain was protecting the Hudson River. How many links in total? About? About? It was 1,500 feet. But the mm. record of how many exact links has been lost. The records were in the New York Library, which unfortunately burned in 1911. But we do have documentation that was 1,500 feet long. I have found 28 real links, and they range from 19 inches to 36 inches. But the average was about two and a half feet. So an average length of the chain was about two feet. To create a chain big enough and long enough to cross the Hudson River that you all said you have seen, I just want to show you how much work went into this, how much effort, and how much iron. What I'd like you to do is just leave the chain there and then step back to your spot. Now, it's like a commercial. I don't have a PowerPoint and I'm not going to put it on the screen. This is the place that I work at. This is the museum that's located right on the Hudson River, directly across from our U.S. Military Academy at West Point. I work at Bosco Bell House and Gardens. Mary Jean Servine, one of your teachers, she reached out to us, was very excited about all of the learning that you've done. Knew that we had a link to the chain. But what I want to say to you is visit your local museums. Some people think that they have to travel far and wide to learn more about history. So you have two representatives here today from a very local museum, the Putnam History S Historical Society, which is a museum. If you're interested to learn more about things around you, not things maybe far away, go to a local museum. They help keep things fresh. They help keep things relevant. But things only stay fresh and relevant because people like you young people are continuing to learn about the world around them. I'm going to flip the picture. At Bosco Bell House and Gardens, this is our view of the Hudson River. We have a southerly view. We look at Bear Mountain Bridge, which is where that first chain was built that was broken through tidal action, the, uh, the uh, bridge army, and all of that. But where we can see directly across the river, it does bring history to life. So whether it's something that you can see with your eyes, whether it's an object that you can come close to, I say to you, perhaps, maybe this year, maybe next, maybe in the next 10 years, I ask you to be inspired by all of the things that you saw here today. But I want you to know that history does not stand still. If you learn, you discover, perhaps you are going to be the one to discover a next link, a link in the chain that connects us with all people behind us and in front of us. So continue to learn. I hope you are inspired. <laughs> have done a really great job at helping all of this come to life. Just reading in a book, that's not, you know, that's not really, that's not the way I like to learn. I like to learn by doing projects, by doing research, having interesting guests come to your school, but also going out into your community and making history come to life for you, because these places are right in your very own backyard. So now I am going to um, turn it over to Don, Mr. Wilder. Oh, yeah.
eyes on the Friends of Sterling Forest. Google Friends of Sterling Forest on your computer, and up will come information, and there'll be a line that says calendar. Click on the calendar, because we do a hike or a lecture almost every Sunday. We will be doing hikes to the forge, to the furnace, and all kinds of major hikes. We don't charge for it. So bring your parents on a weekend. Enjoy. I am there. something together, the teachers, you, everybody, we're working on different lessons of history right here in Putnam County. So we're, this is part of the same project that we've all been talking about, what I keep showing up and talking about, and it, this is going to end up being, you know, this book that we're doing together. So this is pretty cool. This is history in your own backyard. It's pretty neat. So everybody, you know, Google these things up. Look at on um, computers. Do a little reading, Wikipedia, whatever. And try to figure out some things that you didn't know. We've gone from zero to a hundred today as far as this this great chain goes. I learned a ton of stuff, really. I mean, I knew nothing about that forging stuff. That's amazing. So keep it going in your head. It's really fun to sort of keep the ball in the air. All right? Thanks for your attention. We'll see you soon again. Thank you.